Hey everyone, Lewis Rothkop is president over at Martin, a demand side platform that serves brands and agencies looking to maximize their use of first party data. In this episode, I got a chance to sit down and talk with Lewis and pick his brain about some things like performance marketing, attribution models, and how marketing should be really thinking about measuring effectiveness today. There is a massive shift right now in each of these topics, and it was fun to sit down and chat with somebody who's living and breathing this stuff every day. Let's get into it. So, Lewis, it's great having you on the show. It's great to be here, Eric. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think for the audience, if maybe it would just be useful just to tell them a little bit about you, your background, sort of what brought you to Martin and, you know, like where you're at today, what you guys do. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm Lewis. I'm the president of a company called Martin. We're a demand side platform that helps marketers buy media across uh, pools of supply on which they're able to reach their target audiences. I've been in ad tech and digital marketing for the last 23, almost 24 years. Um, and I saw a lot during that time, um, a lot that has evolved and grown and changed over the past two plus decades and a lot that hasn't, uh, almost inexplicably so. And, you know, one of those areas is helping marketers understand is my marketing working, right? It, it sounds elementary. It sounds like kind of the basic thing you'd want to know is you're throwing money at something. But, you know, for way too long, um, marketers have not been able to really get the a full understanding of the causal relationship between their advertising and the consumer taking the requested action. So we think that's nuts. Um, we think that should be better. I think that's nuts and should be better. I spent the most of my career thus far on the supply side, um, really worked on helping to grow the industry, took it as far as I could on the sell side, um, and then eventually came to believe that um, in order to make real change, you got to be on the demand side because that's, of course, where the money is. Uh, and so I heard about this company that's doing something new and different uh, in a space that does not often have things that are new and different. Um, and I wanted to help be a part of it. Yeah, this is cool. So I think, you know, what's interesting, and I, I, I didn't tell you this before we, you know, before we met, but um, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, SharpSpring acquired a retargeting platform called Perfect Audience. And uh, mm. Perfect Audience has been around for a long time. And we, we basically pulled in a lot of its functionality and built it as part of the product. But the thing that we don't do is everything that you're talking about, right? So we're, we, we, what we don't do is, you know, expand beyond, you know, just your, your initial retargeting pool, uh, audience pool, right? We don't really give you access to the other pieces of inventory that you're gonna need as a marketer to be able to go and do your job. And then more importantly, I think, which is fascinating to me, and I wanna dive into that here in a couple of minutes, but it's, it's like, how are you measuring incrementality? How are you measuring the improvement, you know, that, that these ads are having on your overall marketing so that you can see the lift and then allocate budget accordingly. So all yeah. of those things are fascinating. By the way, you're totally speaking my language. I love the fact that you're talking, you know, you're talking about this. I think more people should be. So, you know, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be fun for our audience to listen in. On. Absolutely. So maybe the first question is like, okay, what does that mean in terms of like media, like DSP? Like, you know, so for the people that aren't in, you know, ad tech and don't speak, you know, ad techies, how, like, what does that mean? And what is, you know, like, how does that work in terms of like media buying and that sort of thing? So the industry has done a really good job of needlessly and, and mercilessly overcomplicating how everything works. So to dramatically simplify it, uh, there's basically three constituents that um, marketers need to care about in the programmatic or real-time bidded ad ecosystem. The first is the demand side platform, right? That's the tool set that you use to be able to buy media and data across whatever supply you want to, across whatever data pools you want to, right? Then there's the SSP, the supply side platform, which is essentially a mirror of the DSP. The supply side platform is what publishers use to plug into third-party demand. You work with like a Magnite or an OpenX or any number of, of several good, uh, good platforms. And then right there in the middle is the consumer. Um, and that's the part that too often gets forgotten. Uh, you know, we, we do this to make money. Uh, we do this because it's fun. At the end of the day though, we're consumers too. And, and we go home and we have families and we have lives and we don't 
want to be marketed to in a way that makes us feel creepy or surveilled. Uh, and so a big part of getting the industry on the right path, you're seeing lots of regulation um, over in the EU, GDPR, California, CCPA. I think there's similar legislation um, walk, working its way through the state houses of, of just about every other state. Um, consumers are being loud. They want their data under their control. Uh, and it's not a crazy ask. And so that's sort of mega trend number one that's happening is how do you continue to build this industry and this business with an equal amount of precision and accuracy when you can't get to use some of the tools that you've historically used for precision and accu accuracy. The second part of that goes back to what we said a moment ago, which is um, if you really want to be accurate and you really want to be precise and you really want to make sure that your marketing dollars count, um, then don't waste money. Right. Like go go back and, and ask yourself the famous Wanamaker question of, you know, do you really know which half of your marketing is working? And if you're measuring things like click through rate and you're optimizing to CPM, um, the answer is no. You, you don't know which of your marketing is working. Some of it is. But wouldn't it be great if you could do more of that and less of the stuff that doesn't work? So that's a. That's interesting, right? So, you know, one of the things that I think marketers get stuck on are these vanity metrics, right? You know, and, you know, cost per lead, you know, CPM, you just mentioned that one, right? And at the end of the day, and you know, like if anybody who's been a listener um, for any length of time, they hear me get up on my soapbox and they talk, and I talk about how I really fundamentally dislike, you know, anything that is really like pre like MQL or pre, you know, for a B2B audience, you know, for a B2C audience is, you know, some sort of like acquisition. But, you know, I think the, the question becomes like, we spend so much time talking about those early indicators that really at the end of the day, don't lead to either sales pipeline or actual revenue, right? On the B2B side, on the B2C side, it's, it's obviously an act, you know, a transaction, right? Or some sort. And, the way that we talk about it ourselves and the way that I do it internally is like, I'm looking at my CRM and I'm saying like, what is actually creating, like what kind of advertising activity, what kind of media, what kind of marketing activity am I employing? Am I rolling out that is actually generating the kind of opportunities for my sales team that they will actually go and actually, you know, and close. And, you know, I, I joke about this a lot. I, I'm a really hard, um, client when it comes to be, you know, like working with agencies, not because I think I'm particularly mean or anything. It's just the fact that I know how to sort of game the system, right? Yeah. If I was an agency and I just had to get scored on or comped on number of MQLs or, you know, number of leads up, you know, up top, I can do that for less than a buck a pop, right? I mean, it's really super inexpensive and I can hit my number every single month. The problem is, two, three, four months down the road, whatever the sales cycle is, the longer the sales cycle, the more wiggle room I get to have, right? If I'm on screen to yeah. And, uh, you know, they ultimately end up never closing, right? You know, I got, mm. you know, 5,000 MQLs that I'm driving and I'm, I'm, you know, thumbs up. Everybody's like slapping, you know, high fives all the way around. But ultimately the sales team is struggling because they're hitting half of their quota. And ultimately, yeah. you know, the CFO is like, what the heck? And, and so I think, like, let's talk about that, right? So, you know, you talk about being able to measure it. And what does that mean for you? How, how does your platform actually do that? And then what does that mean for me in my, like, in my context that I just gave? Yeah, great, great point and great question. Um, in almost any industry, there are metrics you can look at to make yourself feel good. Um, there's also metrics you can look at because you want to make yourself feel good and or you're super lazy um, or you're super unsophisticated. And so those metrics continue to exist because some people just like the dopamine. You know, they just like to, to open up the thing and see impressions and clicks. They're like, oh, it must be working. I'm going to go, you know, to lunch now. Um, but are you really to use your CFO example? Like, so what? Like you've got the vanity metric of the click through yeah. Do people who click. Are they any more inherently qualified than those who don't? I don't know. Are they going to buy a product? Do they have enough money to buy the product? Or are they just an enthusiast, let alone an intender? 
Yeah. I don't know. It's 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 not knowable. And and so the only way to really understand whether your advertising is working is to conduct randomly controlled trials. And it's very simple, similar how we do it to how uh, the drug companies uh, do trials. Um, of course, the difference is they're saving lives and, you know, we're serving ads to eyeballs. But the, the idea is very similar, right? You want to create a methodology that eliminates as much bias and noise from the calculation as possible. You want to make it so that those metrics are available always on in the platform that you're using to buy. And you want to make it so that the metrics that you're seeing are immediately applicable to campaigns that are still running. So you could be doing everything right. You could be running a, a brand awareness targeted campaign and you could have hired a uh, market research firm to do uh, surveys and studies and understand how effective the campaign was. Um, but if you get that report four or eight weeks after the campaign's over, now what, right? Like you, you just spent all this money to either hear something really, really good or hear something really, really bad. And so we're, we're big fans of getting our clients data as close to real time as possible so that they can actually impact the campaign um, as it's running. So I think if, if, if you're putting something like that together where in an, in an always on format, right? You're just, you're constantly gathering that feedback to figure out, you know, what's the, what is the lift that you're getting? Do you, how do you, how do you think about that in terms of like tying it back into like a transactional platform, whatever e-commerce shopping cart or whatever you're using, or potentially a CRM if you're, you know, I know you're more e-commerce leaning, but you know, I, I think about, both of those like how do you like offline server side is there a way to be able to to track back and understand a little bit more about like what's actually driving that incrementality yeah so no question that closing the loop is absolutely critical mm -hmm. and and you know using us as, a, as an example uh we measure incrementality at all stages of the funnel um, you know, some of our clients only want to do bottom funnel, some top, uh, several of them want to do full funnel, uh, keep all their buys in one platform, see all the reports together. And depending upon where in the funnel the target is, um, we've got a, a incrementality measurement option um, that should work well for you, right? So in the case of brand awareness uh, or brand lift or, or brand sentiment, um, we work with a company called Lucid. Uh, they're one of the largest, uh, I believe, panels of consumers, panel of panels, I think they call it. Yeah. Um, and we run trials and we show some of them the ad and we show not some of them the ad. Yeah. And they uh, query their panel and we see how effective it was. And then we give that information to the client right away so that they can act on it. Opposite end of the spectrum in terms of the funnel, um, online sales. So, or, or uh, leads to website, right? So quality leaders <laughs> to the website. Um, that's a heck of a lot easier of a funnel, of a, of a, uh, a loop to close because the action that you take is immediately recognized. We have, you know, some means of getting signal back from the conversion event and then incrementality measurement, lift measurement and optimization happens in real time at all times. So um, if you're in the middle of the funnel, if you're trying to drive foot traffic to a location, um, we do that with a partner. Um, and it's really a question of what the marketer's goals are. And then we'll figure out what's the most appropriate approach. Not one that necessarily provides the best feel-good metrics, because um, we think that that's silly. Um, but we think you should be focusing on stuff that actually drives business, which is not crazy. Yep. No, I think that's exactly right. And look, I mean, there's such a, like, there's such a desire to have a tighter alignment around business outcomes, right? Yeah. What you're looking for today, like obviously there's a big movement you know, in, um, in that direction. I think we've somehow gotten ourselves into trouble, right? And I think you'll probably appreciate this, Lewis. Like we've gotten ourselves into trouble with, you know, using attribution as it's somehow like the single source of truth as opposed to what I would really more categorize it as is like good for directional purposes, like to help you yes. source what's going on. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's not a one to one correlation. So I think the, the here's my question. Um, what is like the correlation between, or, you know, maybe you've done this, I'm not sure, but what, I'm curious, like what is the correlation between an attribution tool 
and your results? And can you use that connection or that correlation to be able to make other like downstream like decisions? Just it all comes down to what do you want? Right. Do you want to feel good and see some numbers that make it look like you're doing your job right. and then give more business to those that generate the good numbers and, and less that don't? Um, if you want to do a good job, um, you know, ask yourself, what are the numbers I'm getting? Who provided those numbers um, and what do they actually mean? And, you know, I hate to keep going back to the, the click through rate example, but if all you want to do as a marketer is optimize to CTR or even optimize to CTA, just do it. Like there's plenty of places you can do yeah. that. I'll tell you what they're going to do. Yeah. They're going to limit the number of frequencies that a consumer sees the ad. They're going to optimize to weird things like session depth and cookie recency in order to get the attribution. But are they really going to um, demonstrably move shampoo off the shelves for you? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Right. And, and so if you just want to feel good, if you just want the sugar high of some awesome numbers, awesome looking numbers, then yeah, th those are those are options. If you want to actually do it the right way, and you're probably going to spend a little bit more, right? Because if you could get a hundred great customers for a dollar, but a thousand great customers for two dollars, you'd spend those two dollars, right? Sometimes you have to help people, you know, realize that. Um, and if you measure incrementality, things like frequency is going to go up. Because we've seen that there's a, a N number of frequency hits that a user needs to receive in order to be in prime position to um, take the action uh, sought after in the campaign. Yeah. So if you're gonna look, if you're gonna look at an incrementality targeted campaign and measure it by click-through rate or CPA, the results will be terrible. Right. Like what what you should do as a marketer is focus on the media plans and outlets and tactics that let you actually drive real business. Um, however, you define, you know, what that driving is, if it's a website visit or a purchase or a lead, et cetera. So there's this there's I guess you're, as I hear you talking, there's this uh, conversation that sort of comes to mind. I was sitting down and I was talking with a B2C company that. Um, you know, they're driving, I don't know, half a million visitors a month, something like that. You know, it's not huge, huge, but, you know, fairly decent size. Mm. And um, they, media team, the media buying team, uh, the, you know, the traffic acquisition team, whatever, whatever you want to call it, was in a meeting with the conversion rate optimization folks and people that were sort of mid funnel and on. And, and what they sell is like a free, it's a, a consumer free trial sample mm. sample. And uh, what was fascinating, I was the fly on the wall, right? And what was fascinating to me was there was this this discussion where sales are sorry, between the, the traffic team saying, look, we're we're hitting our number, right? Yeah, number of unique visitors and and the type of traffic that's coming through. It's the right mix. We feel really good about it. And we're hitting our number and it's hitting according to plan. And you know, we were slightly over budget a little bit, right? You know, in terms of against plan. And they were really excited about the results. And then the team that was responsible for optimization and free trials was getting this significant amount of pressure from the CMO saying, look, like, why can't we convert more of this traffic? Like, what are we doing wrong? You know, it's like, we got to do this and we got to work on, you know, this free trial offer. We've got to change the, we got to test the new price point and we got to do this other stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, why did we just take the acquisitions team sort of like word for it? <laughs> when they, Absolutely. You know, and, Absolutely. and like, why did we just skip past that assumption? Like, yeah, they started off the meeting, but we're, we're like assuming like we're, we're definitely accepting the premise that what they're sending is the right kind of traffic and, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. yeah. And, and like everybody on the, on the optimization in the free trip, like that's controllable somehow we can fix that. And uh, it was fascinating to me because you, you could just tell like there's a lot of internal politics that were happening. Uh, you know, the, the folks on the acquisition team, they were in my experience I, or, or based on my, 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 my perspective uh they were like they owned the meeting right they ran the meeting they were sort of the hippo in the room they 
were dictating the conversation and everybody around the table was accepting the premise that, you know, that's the right kind of tracking. And it's actually a, a conversion problem. You know, and I'm thinking to myself, I'll bet you, based on what I'm seeing with the mix and like the different channels they're using and things like that, I'll bet you that this is less about a middle of the funnel and a lot about like what kind of traffic we're driving. And, uh, you know, and it was just fascinating to me because I think there's just that, that, that same scenario plays out in every single organization. There's always this sort of like finger pointing, you know, it might be socially acceptable, you know, finger pointing, but at the end of the day, there's finger pointing that says, I'm doing my job, like, you know, CYA, right? And then over here, it's like, no, I'm doing my job, right? And there's this, you know, and so I think like getting everybody on the same page and letting the data dictate the direction and where the area of responsibility for improvement lies. And usually it's not either or, right? It's both and. And so I think the question becomes like, you know, maybe for you is like, does what you do help with that sort of problem, right? So we just want to come in like with, with the data and this is what the data is going to tell us and it yeah. help both teams get better. Like, do you do that? Like, does that, is that usually like the outcome of some of the stuff that you work on? In many cases, we're a bridge. So, so one of the first things that we noticed in trying to close the loop for clients is that the marketing side of the business and the rest of the business often live in two very different environments. And okay. so you've got the marketing side of the business that is focusing on delivering their metrics. Um, in many cases, those metrics are, are less than ideal. And then you've got the sales side of the business and the production side of the business and all of the recipients of benefit from the marketing and just like a big cubicle wall between yeah. those two sides. And 100%. until you break down that wall, you're going to be operating your business in silos. And, you know, then you're going to have these sort of circular firing squads that you um, that you had suggested. Uh, one of the reasons, this is my opinion, that uh, the latest wave of, of DTC um, companies uh, has just completely blown away just about every space that they have sought uh, to differentiate is because you don't have, generally speaking, massive political operations internally. You don't have, you know, internecine politics. You don't have, you know, horse trading. You don't have one person saying, well, campaign failed because the creative was terrible. And the other person saying, no, the campaign failed because the targeting was terrible. You just have a team. Um, and I think larger marketers are starting to have started to see that um, and are running really, really sharp organizations. Um, managing to the things, again, that actually drive the business forward. If the marketing VP, you know, gets a great score on their uh, on their annual review because their CTR numbers were there, then that's great for the head of marketing. It's, it's not great for the person who has to count the money at the end of the day. So shouldn't we be tying our success as individuals, as a department, as an organization, as an agency to the things that actually do make a difference? So, so what is the, what does that look like in a conversation, right? So you're coming to them with certain reporting and you are empowering that marketing team, right? And, and really becoming that bridge between, you know, the business side and the, and the, you know, the traffic slash marketing, marketing team. I, what is that? What does that deliverable sort of look like? Is that literally like there's a centralized dash that everybody has access to? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so so I'll give you two real examples that I think um, will illustrate uh, the answer. The first is uh, a client of ours who is in the business of performing um, elective medical procedures. Um, and they've got locations, they do this all around the country. Um, like anything else, you got to market it. You've got consumers who are interested, consumers who don't know that they're interested yet. Yeah. And so they spend money on, on advertising. And one of the first things they realized was that it does not make sense for us to spend money on advertising where I don't have places that people can come and get this procedure done. So let's not show them ads. And so what we do um, when we run campaigns for them is we do a dip into their um, appointment booking system uh, in real time. And so we will know if this ad is about to be surfaced to a consumer who does not have any available appointments in the next two months, 
let's just not show it to them or let's be, you know, let's bid very, very little to them versus if I know this person is in a location where there's an abundance of availability open, let's spend more money to show this to them. Um, another example is um, retailers and e-commerce uh, companies that do loyalty programs. So we have a client that really bases their business around uh, recency, uh, frequency, and monetary value scores um, among their consumers. And then based upon what those scores are uh, for the anonymous consumer that uh, has an opportunity to be served an ad, that ad will be bid on uh, more or less or not at all, depending upon how likely it is for the user will convert um, based upon what the, the, the marketer knows and based upon what um, we know as the demand side platform. And, and, and so long answer to your short question, um, you have to look at it as a different journey for each consumer in each marketer category, or you're just gonna have kind of, you know, rubber stamp cut and paste results. So, if you were to, uh, I don't know if this is possible or not, so feel free to say no, but do you have a an example, a case study kind of concept, case, you know, where you could just sort of walk us through, like a client came to you with a particular problem, right? And they came to mm -hmm. you and they said, look, this is what we're trying to solve. And can you help us and, and sort of like tell us like why they came to you, what you were trying to solve, and then maybe like, what were the results? Like, like, walk us through that because I think that's like I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm saying, "Wow, this is interesting." Like, I could consider, like, I could think about us using this, right? Where, like, we have different use cases where we would potentially benefit from from something like this. I'm just kind of curious, like, walk us through that. Like, somebody calls you up one day and says, "You know, hey, here's my here's my issue." Yeah, so I'll try to play two sides of that conversation. So, hi, here's my issue. Great. Uh, thank you for bringing your issue to us. Um, you want to spend some money on marketing. You don't really know how well it's working. Um, what's your target? Like, What's your goal? Well, my goal is to sell more shampoo. Cool. Do you sell it direct? Or do you sell it through a retail location? Only through a retail location. Okay, great. So what do you know about your consumers? Nothing, because we sell only through retail. Our, our, our consumers are the stores in which we sell the stuff. So we've been wanting for a long time to build an open dialogue with end users, but we've just never done it because that's not how the business has been structured. But boy, I see that like joesoaps.com is taking the world by storm, um, and I don't want them to start cutting into my um, soap profits. So, okay. so what do you do? Um, well, the first thing you do is you think about what unique data that you have. Like what asset do you have that nobody else can get? What do you know about your customers, about your consumers that nobody else does? And if you, know, if you use the soap example, like maybe you don't have names and addresses and phone numbers of consumers, but you certainly have a plot on the map, I'm sure, of the locations where stores sell more and less of your amazing soap. And you probably even have some competitive intelligence on where your peer companies are, are selling soap. And so, great, that's data point number one. Data point number two, you probably know something about when people choose to buy soap. Like, what are the things that happen in a person's life or day? Well, it's 90 degrees out, uh, and air conditioning is too expensive this year, and so everyone sweats and everyone smells. So, um, now would be a really good time in the cities in which it is north of 90 degrees put up an ad that says, oh, you're sweating a little bit, like now'd be a great time to get some soap. So now you've taken um, two different pieces of information. The first is something that only you know about your consumers, right? Second is something that anybody can know about the weather. Third piece of information is um, third party data, right? So we know who we want to show these to geographically. We know when we want to show them based upon, you know, the weather of the moment. Um, but what else do we want to do to target them? Do we want to reach out to people who are in a particular age bracket? Do we want to reach out to men or women? Do we want to reach out to people with these interests? And then the challenge that you've got there very often is, is a marketer will see the menu of data targeting options and just like be staring at it forever because there are so many options, so many different permutations of, of different segments. And so yeah. then you do that and then you run a estimate of, of how much, like what's the scale? Right. Like, are, are you now targeting with all of those parameters an audience of millions or are you targeting an audience of tens? 
And if it's tens, you should probably back up and, and you know, rethink your targeting. If it's millions, then maybe you want to um, start thinking about other elements that help you decide what to bid for impression-wise and, and where and why. And that's where we can come in um, as well and, and take the algorithms that we've developed and tune them to our client's business. So, you know, the, 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 the medical procedure company is an example of that. Uh, the loyalty card data is an example of that. We work with a quick serve restaurant um, that ran different advertising depending upon um, the weather. Uh, they had some research that said people buy this product when it's hot out and people buy this product when it's cold out uh, and they do it at this time of day. And so taking all of that data and then having the discipline to look at it when it's done and not say, oh, the CTR was 1%, must have done great. Or the CTR was 0.1%, we did terribly. But actually say, well, well, no, how many more sandwiches were rung up on the POS at the locations that consumers saw this, right? How many more appointments were booked that were qualified to turn into the actual procedure? How many more in-store visits were there? You know, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, you get the idea. The, the thing that we're shouting from the rooftops and that I know I'm, I'm kind of being uh, annoyingly persistent on is that um, you've got to measure this stuff everywhere. You, it's not enough to say, oh, we do incrementality at the bottom of the funnel, but the top is just branding and you can't measure branding. So, you know, F it. Well, you yep. can measure branding and, yep. and you should. And if you're not, you're wasting money. Yep. hundred percent. I, I love I love that philosophy. I think there are so many marketers that are listening to this right now and saying, I have been wanting to say this. I felt it for a long time, but I've not been able to have a mechanism or a vehicle to go and, and do something like that. And and I think one of the questions I think probably people are having is like, okay, well, this probably requires a ridiculously large budget to go and execute against. Like what what is the what is a budget that is realistic to be able to measure and 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 test like this to be able to get that kind of feedback, that kind of loop going? It's a great question. Um, when you do studies, things like um, uh, brand perception studies and brand lift and, and footfall measurement, you do need to have enough scale in the campaign to reach uh, statistical significance and have the numbers actually make sense as modeled. So you do want enough signal coming in um, in order to be able to know all right, am I really having the lift on this campaign that I thought, or is the data too noisy and too small um, so as to not produce any uh, you know, uh, helpful um, unifying data? So you know, what does that mean in terms of dollars? You're probably going to need to be spending in the tens of thousands of dollars a month um, on the low side to be able to get the most out of a program um, like that. If you want to measure brand lift, if you want to measure footfall, if you even want to measure you know, website conversion, you probably want to be in the 10K per month plus range. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you know, opportunities scale up as budgets do. And there's you know, certainly um, the ability to do more things with more budget. But just sort of getting into it uh, and saying, this is the month I'm going to start measuring and optimizing more carefully, probably about 10,000 bucks a month would be my guess. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that's good for somebody just as a level set to say, okay, is this something that's even achievable, right? And there's a lot of people on that are they're listening, yeah. you know, to this and they're saying, yeah, okay, well, that makes sense. We would peel off some of that test budget, allocate it to something like this to help us because that in and of itself is probably worth the, like the spend just to understand more about, you know, what's working, what's yes. not working. Yeah, totally. totally well, well, you, you mentioned test budget and, and, and that's where, that's where things get a little, um, sticky. Uh, and I'll explain why. Um, in order to optimize to and measure a campaign on incrementality, mm -hmm. you got to be bought in that that's what you want to do. Because if you are a CPA based advertiser, it's what you know, it's what you do. Yeah. And one of my salespeople is so good at convincing you to run a campaign with incrementality measurement, just peel off a piece of it. Um, as incrementality goes up, CPA goes down, um, right? And, and, and so incrementality goes up, CPA goes down in the wrong way, um, not, not a good way. And, and the reason for that is when you're actually optimizing to a metric that matters, you have to reach consumers multiple times. And so if you're looking at um, the piece of the campaign that's optimized to incrementality, the piece that's optimized to CPA, 
the piece that's optimized to uh, incrementality is gonna look terrible from a CPA standpoint, but it's actually reflective of the real world and of what's actually mattering for your business. So if you're gonna look at a piece of a campaign next to a piece that's much larger and that uses an older method, um, you've gotta understand that what looks good in spot A is not necessarily the same um, terms as what looks good in, in spot B, if that makes sense. Sorry, you cut out there for me like just a second ago, oh. but, 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 I, but yeah, I mean, I totally agree. So, I mean, I think if you have that split like that and you are totally bought in, it gives you that ability to turn around and, 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 and be able to measure in a way that helps you yes. make better business decisions, you know, knowing what to cut out and knowing what to double down on. I think that's fascinating. Yes. And, and by the way, it's fat. It's also really cool just listening to hear you talk because like there's a lot of the same language, a lot of the same sort of approach that I, you know, typically espouse when it comes to email and other channels, uh, doing, doing exactly the same thing, but doing it, you know, in, in, in other, in other channels. I think the thing that you have going for you is you're able to reach the market right before they ever, you know, they've ever arrived. And I think that, you know, so many marketers right now are saying, I need more of that reach to be able to, to drive that. And, you know, like I've got everything else figured out. I've got my middle of the funnel figured out. I've got low, you know, bottom of the funnel figured out. But, um, and if I can mm -hmm. get into the site or whatever, right. But I need to know how to expand that. I need to do that with confidence and I need to be able to again, sort of know what to cut out and, and know where to double down on. So that's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, so, absolutely. absolutely. So Lewis, I mean, any, do you have any questions for me? Um, sometimes like, you know, in these kind of conversations, it's always fun to flip the, you know, flip the uh, discussion a little bit. Um, do you have any questions for me? Anything that like, you're just especially curious about? I know we were talking a little bit before this call, but anything that I can, yeah, you guys, you talk to marketers all day, every day. You talk to them in a slightly different point in the life cycle um, than we do, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. Do you think that um, particularly B2B marketers are open to the notion of next-gen measurement, really understanding what's working? Or do you think there are just too many ingrained, hardwired inefficiencies so that if someone's, you know, MBO is a 1% click through rate, like that's just not changing. Like how, yeah. how hopeful <laughs> do you yeah. think we should be? I, I think very hopeful. I mean, there's a major movement that's happening right now, specifically in B2B around sort of the breaking down of the notion that attribution is, is, you know, again, that single source of truth and not in reality flawed. And, yeah. and obviously the bigger the sales cycle, the, you know, the harder that is. And, and, but marketers are getting that now, I think. And there's a, there's a yeah. handful of folks that are out there that are sort of out there preaching this and, and saying, look, we like, this is actually the way it works. Right. You know, and, and, and in a lot of ways, things like third party cookies and, and other, other sort of risk factors that have traditionally been viewed as risks, uh, at least for marketers, uh, are are less so because it, in reality, creates an opportunity, right? So if you really have dialed in your ICP super well and you really understand who your audience is and you really have gotten that nailed, which is like fundamental 101, right? And you are able to drive, you know, the kind of folks, you know, that, that, getting out in front of that ICP in a way that, you know, maybe you've been hamstrung by before, right? So in B2B, yeah. especially like, you know, if you can't show working anyway, working for like somebody who is a non-marketing executive, who's just looking at dollar in dollar out uh, and not, it doesn't really understand like marketing. It doesn't understand like the fundamentals of why, a certain percentage of your budget needs to be brand related and demand related uh, that isn't directly mm. attributable to a, you know, a lead that's coming in the door that you've captured in a form somewhere. 
um, if you if you are a marketer that does get that and they that you have you know you have executive buy-in at that level that does you know uh, support you uh, you are going to win in this new world right uh, as opposed yeah. to somebody who's still stuck in that old way and I think you know obviously it started with b2c or d2c right and and because it's just a quicker it's easier to see right it's quicker uh, iterative but in b2b where there are I would argue probably larger budgets, less um, less organization around, you know, mm. like where the where dollars are being spent and what the ROI is on it. Uh, you know, I think there's probably lots more room for opportunity uh, in B two B than than you know than anywhere. Uh, so those are all things I would point to as being encouraging you know, sort of data points. It is encouraging. Within this movement, right, that's happening. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I get, Lewis, like, you know, there are a lot of people listening right now and, and maybe a few of them are like, I would really like to maybe understand a little bit more about this methodology, how you guys do this stuff. Like, how would somebody get a hold of you uh, just to, you know, have another conversation? Yeah, so hello at martin.ai uh, will get you to me and to some other uh, astonishingly smarter than me people. Um, and, and look, if you want to buy from us, great. We've got a website, martin.ai. Um, if you don't want to buy from us, that's great too. One of our core values is um, the free diffusion of knowledge uh, in the industry. So if you just want to go to our website and you're like, you know what, I don't have the need for DSP, I don't have the budget for DSP, whatever, but I want to get some good POVs and case studies and white papers on all things um, programmatic marketing and, and incrementality measurement um, uh, centric, just come do it. Like, yeah. just come do it. Uh, Martin.ai, you click on news, you see all that stuff. And if we can help, um, we'd love to. Uh, there's really no stage of the funnel that we're not able to add some value in. But if all you want to do is talk, uh, talk shop, we're, we're down for that as well. That's, that's very cool. That's very cool. Yeah. I think there probably are some folks that are listening that are saying, you know what, we're we, like in this market, we're trying to figure some of this out. We're trying to answer this exact same question, you know, and, uh, you know, this might be valuable for them. So this is cool. Lewis. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for joining us, man. This is awesome. I appreciate it. Thank you. I had a blast. Really appreciate you having me on. All right. All right.